Hey, I am the Greg, one of the hosts of the Greg and Dave Show. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good here on Public House Media. I just want to thank you for listening to the following broadcast brought to you by Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope that you'll come check out my show, How to Write Good, the writing show that is not about writing. A new show of How to Write Good comes up every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of How to Write Good. Again, thanks for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. The latest headlines. The Houston Astros, the defending World Series champions, got better adding Garrett Cole. The insightful interviews. Rick Saratella, NFL Draft Bible. With how much emphasis is put on the position, yet how many over the last couple of years we've had questions, why do we put such an emphasis on drafting a quarterback number one overall? The bottom line is there's not enough good quarterbacks to go around. And I think with the new CBA, it's really a low-risk gamble now. If you look at the playoff teams, the common denominator, good quarterback play. The hottest takes. I think the guy to blame is the one guy who hasn't left yet. I think Russell Westbrook is one of the bigger problems in Oklahoma City. Can all be found on Press Row. Broadcasting is part of the Public House Media Network. Here's your host. It doesn't matter what your name is. Christian Heimel. Welcome on Press Row, everybody. Christian Heimel with you. Broadcasting, as always, part of the Public House Media Network on this Thursday December 6, 2018. It's been an exciting week in sports. There's a ton to get to. The MLB hot stove is uh, in fuego, just completely engulfed right now. Three big deals over the last week. Uh, four, really, if you count the Gene Segura deal to the Phillies uh, from Seattle. But a lot to get to. We're going to talk with Jared Smith, MLB reporter, in just a little bit. Friend of the show, he's going to jump on and talk with us about it all. We'll get to your listener questions as well. Uh, plenty to get to. A lot to talk about. Here, uh, I, I know it's the first week of December. I know for a lot of people, there's snow that they're dealing with. Uh, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold right now, so you can tell that it's winter. We're playing hurt here uh, on Press Row, but uh, we're still going to fight through it. It, it. It's one of those times that it's very strange because there's a lot that goes on. A lot of sports are in there, actually. You know, you're talking a lot about what's actually going on on the field, on the court. And then you got baseball where it's really starting to heat things up, and we're excited to talk about it. A lot to go into it. So uh, we'll talk with Jared Smith here in just a little bit. But I do want to get to some of the other headlines because there are some things that have just kind of bothered me a little bit over the last couple of days. The biggest one, honestly, is what Kevin Durant uh, had to say uh, recently in an interview with Bleacher Report uh, discussing the challenges associated with playing with James, saying, quote, it depends on what kind of player you are. If you're Kyle Korver, then it makes sense because Kyle Korver in Atlanta was the bulk of the offense and he's not a number one option at all, not even close. So his tal- talents benefit more from a guy who can pass and penetrate and get him open. If you're a younger player, this is uh, Durant going on to say, if you're a younger player like a Kawhi, Trying to pair him with LeBron James doesn't really make sense. Kawhi enjoys having the ball in his hands, controlling the offense, dictating the tempo with his post-ups. It's how he plays the game. A lot of young players are developing that skill. They don't need another guy. It's very strange to me to hear Kevin Durant. He might be the most sensitive professional athlete ever. But this whole Draymond Green thing that happened with him... This whole, you know, is the speculation of him going to L.A. to play with LeBron and he's starting to kind of get defensive about that. I'm sorry, Kevin, but you had to go and join a team that was already set. So what you're saying is you're not a number one guy. You're, you know, Kyle Korver. You're not Kawhi Leonard. You're a veteran who had to go and join Steph Curry, Andre Iguodala, Clay Thompson, uh, and, and Draymond Green to win championships. Now, don't get me wrong. Back-to-back finals MVP, pretty talented, but... You know, come on. I mean, you can't really be talking smack about how guys, you shouldn't be pairing young guys with LeBron James just because you, you know, don't like the idea that people are throwing your name out there to move to L.A. and be part of the Lakers. Other thing that bothered me with him, uh, you know, he, he says, uh, quote, so much hype comes from being around LeBron, uh, from being around LeBron from other people. He has so many fanboys in the media. Even the beat writers just fawn over him. I'm like, we're playing basketball here, and it's not even about basketball at certain points. Okay, again, Kevin, he's the best player on the planet. He is the best player 
in the game. Maybe the best player ever, in my personal opinion. Uh, so, of course, people are going to fawn over him. They did the same thing over Michael. They did the same thing with Magic. They did it with you a little bit at Texas and in Oklahoma City. They've done it with you know Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. So it's not just LeBron James. He's the best player on the planet, and what he's doing is incredible. And I think Kevin Durant is actually a little upset that he's won back-to-back finals. He's won back-to-back finals MVP. He's a league MVP, and he doesn't get talked about in the same breath as LeBron James. Kevin Durant is, is is honestly, in my opinion, one of the most emotionally sensitive players, athletes in the professional ranks. I've never just look at his history with his fake Twitter accounts, with his spats with Russell Westbrook, his spats with James Harden, uh, you know, this whole thing with Draymond Green. Now, it's it's embarrassing to me. It really is that that, that Kevin Durant has to consistently have conversations. And I don't know if this was brought up. I don't know if, if the the interviewee, uh, you know, brought it up uh, to to Kevin Durant. Said you know thoughts about playing with, uh, you know, LeBron James. But the the article was by Rick Buecher saying why doesn't anyone want to play with LeBron anymore? So yeah, so they talked about it. But still, come on. I mean, really, really, Kevin Durant, you can't just sit there and figure out why your own teammates are yelling at you. Why, you know, and, and yes, Draymond Green's in the wrong, but it's it's seriously ridiculous to hear Kevin Durant whine and moan and complain uh, about all of this stuff because he's not getting the attention he feels like he deserves. I think Kevin Durant feels he's the best player in the game and that he's not getting the respect that he feels he deserves. So he's whining about it. Nobody talked about Tyson Chandler in that interview. Nobody talked about any of the other guys, Kevin Love, whoever else it was. It's Kevin Durant. He's the one who's talking about it. He's the one who's getting names, who's getting his name thrown out there. But we'll see. I, I, I don't know. He, it's ridiculous. It really is to watch you know, Kevin Durant continue to do this and be this, this emotionally sensitive professional. Just go out and ball, dude. You're one of the best in the game. You're one of the best ever. Just go out and ball. Have fun with it. I can't. I, basketball gets a little ridiculous, especially in the NBA. It becomes a soap opera. And Kevin Durant right now, is, is days of our lives. So we'll see how this progresses through. Who knows? But it's just strange to watch. When we come back, uh, we'll talk MLB hot stove, big time trades, a free agent signing. What does this mean for Manny Machado, Bryce Harper? Are the New York Mets now the favorite in the NL East? Are they done dealing? Jared Smith, MLB reporter, is going to join us. He doesn't think so. He thinks this, this could be a lot more for the New York Mets. It's all coming up in a little bit. You're on Press Row. Broadcasting is part of the Public House Media Network. Listen to every episode and get the latest shows sent right to you. Subscribe to Press Row on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Or visit us online at www.thephmedia.com. This is John Vaughter, host of The Cheap Seats here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, The Cheap Seats, where we talk about sports from the fans' perspective. A new show comes out every Monday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of The Cheap Seats. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a public house media podcast. Welcome back on Press Row. Christian Heimel here with you this Thursday, December 6, 2018. And uh, the MLB winter meetings start coming up on Monday, but... uh, the hot stove has wasted very little time in getting to a boiling point uh, with three big deals over the last week. Obviously, Robinson Cano and Edwin Diaz to the Mets, uh, Patrick Corbin to the Nationals, and then uh, Wednesday uh, afternoon or an evening, we find out that Paul Goldschmidt is heading to the Cardinals to help us talk a little bit about all of this. Jared Smith, MLB.com, back on the show once again. Jared, let's start there with Goldschmidt. I mean, most surprising move of the week so far that we've seen? Yeah, definitely a blockbuster deal, especially with Goldie spending his whole career in Arizona and, you know, just the force in the middle of that lineup. You know, the Diamondbacks are really trying to retool after they had their run a few years ago, and now they've kind of fallen off a bit. 
Uh, but it, it was about as surprising to us as it probably was to, you know, a lot of the players involved with the deal. And, you know, a rare thing in this deal, you see a, a draft pick gets traded, which is, you know, something you don't see very often in baseball. You see it more so in football than anything else. But with Goldschmidt going to St. Louis, it just makes that National League Central so stacked. Obviously, the Cubs and Pirates have been so good in recent years, and the Cardinals have kind of been up and down. But now they've really solidified the middle of that lineup, and, and, and he's – Obviously, the credentials speak for himself, probably one of the best hitters uh, in baseball over the last five to eight seasons, and, and now he's going to be in the middle of that lineup at Bush Stadium. What does this say about where the Diamondbacks are now? I mean, you, you lost J.D. Martinez last year. You just traded yeah. away Goldschmidt. And then, I mean, not to mention, you, you literally you know, have just lost Patrick Corbin as well. So what does this say where the Diamondbacks are, considering they were a team that was two games above five hundred this year? Yeah, and, and they really just let Patrick Corbin walk. There were really no talks at all about keeping him, nor nor did they want to. I just think that price tag is too high. But they're clearly in a rebuilding mode. Um, the National League West, obviously, you've got the Dodgers, who have been in the World Series you know, the last two seasons, and, and, and they're certainly the leaders of the pack. The Rockies have been strong the last couple of years as well. They've really come on. And, you know, the Diamondbacks were a playoff team two years ago and, you know, in, in, in that wild card game, but just didn't quite get over the hump and, and pitching certainly a reason why. And that's why I thought it was a little surprising that they really didn't even make a run at Corbin. And now they let Goldschmidt go. And granted, they did get some really good prospects back in the deal, including Luke Weaver, who, uh, you know, is certainly going to be uh, someone that they're going to try to rely on to, to rebuild that rotation. But, uh, really, really tough loss for the car. I mean, for the uh, Diamondbacks, as, as you're clearly in rebuilding mode now. Another team that it looks like is, is going into full rebuild mode: uh, the Seattle Mariners, with the trade of Edwin Diaz and Robinson Cano uh, to the Mets over the weekend. That was a team that they were right there competing for a wild card spot late in, in the season. Here, why make the decision to to rebuild now? That's an interesting situation in Seattle. Obviously, the payroll is certainly something that they keep an eye on very closely out there. Um, when they signed Cano uh, a few years ago, that was an eye-popping contract to a lot of people in the business and, and, and certainly in, in, in the front offices of a lot of different teams. The Yankees weren't even close uh, to that number that Seattle offered him. And I think that number has finally caught up with the team. Um, the Edwin D I mean, to consider Edwin Diaz as a throw in to that deal who led the majors and saves last year is eye popping in itself. I think there's a decent chance that Diaz has a bigger impact on the Mets than Cano just because yeah. of what they need in the bullpen and what he can bring to the table. And I think it really does show how Seattle, similar to Arizona, smaller market, smaller payroll, not as quite the expectations as you see in New York or you see in St. Louis, which are obviously perennial teams that you would expect to be in the playoff picture. So they have a little more wiggle room in terms of letting some of these guys go. Uh, we don't really know what the hall will return for Seattle. Uh, again, the Mets prospects have been very hit or miss over the last few years. Uh, the big thing that surprised me in that deal was the Mets did not get as much money as I expected. Yeah. They only got $20 million. Um, We thought it, that number was going to be perhaps double that. And I think that is very indicative of the Mets changing their strategy. I would say right now, uh, for the first time maybe in forever, the Mets are the aggressor in New York City in terms of baseball. Um, we've heard a lot of things come out of Mets camp over the last couple of weeks that are things we would usually hear from the Bronx. Yeah. And I think it's a changing of the guard a little bit with what Brody Van Wagenen has done. And it's going to be really interesting over the next few weeks to see how the tone changes compared to Bronx and Queens. Very different dynamic right now than we're used to. Speaking with Jared Smith here on Press Row talking MLB offseason, uh, you mentioned Brody Van Wagenen. He doesn't seem done. I mean, rumors about JT Realmuto, rumors about A.J. Pollock. Are, are the Mets, it really seems, again, with that young pitching staff, they are finally have a GM in place who understands that now is the time to win. It's actually ironic how the Mets, they not only got it right with Van Wagen, and again, this is just my opinion, I think he's the perfect right man, right spot. You, you hear that phrase in baseball all the time, you know, when in, in a clutch situation at the plate, you get a guy up there who's been hot. I think that's what they've got in Van Wagenen. I think baseball, the free agent landscape is changing so much because of the depth of these contracts yeah. that it does help to have someone in his spot that has dealt with the other side of it. 
And obviously, being an agent, he represents Cespedes, represents Cano. So he, he understands the negotiation process, and he understands the aggression you need to have to bring in some of these big-name free agents. We're in a very different time in Major League Baseball. 15, 20 years ago, there's only a handful of teams that could afford some of these contracts. Now, with the sell of uh, BAMTEC, with revenue sharing, every single one of these teams, if they're willing to spend the money, can afford to go get these guys. So you have to stand out from the crowd. You have to be able to offer them something different. Obviously, the Yankees have their brand, the Cardinals, the Dodgers. Those are brand-name teams. If you're a team like the Mets, that's kind of coming from behind. You have to be a little bit outside the box, and I think that's exactly what Van Wagenen brings to the table. And I wouldn't be surprised if you heard Bryce Harper's name rumored to go to New York soon, and not to the Yankees, to the Mets. So Lord. he's bringing a level of energy and a level of spice that we haven't seen in Queens in a really long time. I think it's going to energize the fan base, and I think it's a really exciting time to be a Mets fan. It's interesting you bring up Harper with regards to the Mets, simply because there had been a lot of conversation, you know, and, and you may have heard differently, of Harper potentially just going up the road to Philadelphia, um, but with or maybe even staying home in Washington. With the signing of Patrick Corbin and with the trade for the Phillies to get Gene Segura, what does this do now for the markets of both Bryce Harper and for Manny Machado, who both, it seemed at one point, could realistically end up in Philadelphia? Yeah, and it's funny. I think Harper and Machado, you're sitting back here right now, and you're happy because you're seeing all these guys go off the table. And now you get to kind of see where you would fit on a certain team. And, and, and this is a crazy theory, but I think the Mets might be in on Harper just to drive up the price for the Phillies and the Nationals because they know that it's going to cost you a pretty penny to get one of these guys, especially Harper, I think, more so than Machado. And if the Nationals kind of spend their entire budget on Corbin and Harper, there's a lot of holes on that Nationals team that are not going to get filled in other areas. So Van Wagen, and I think, and, and he's really been the, the leading the charge on this. I think the Mets right now, even though they might not end up signing Harper, I think just throwing their name into the hat and showing that aggression, whether it's false aggression or not, is going to set the market for some of these other teams. And I think it's very interesting, the strategy that we're seeing right now coming out of New York, because I do think for the first time in, it has to be forever, the Mets are the big guy at the table. And it seems as though Jeff Wilpon's willing to open up those purse strings a little bit and spend some of this money. And yeah, you're seeing Philadelphia make their moves. You're seeing Washington make their moves. But Harper and Machado are the big breadwinners of this free agent class. And where they sign will set the tone for what 2019 looks like in terms of the divisional landscape. If everyone comes to the National League East, it's going to be real interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, without knowing where Machado and Harper could end up, uh, more competitive division in 2019, the NL Central or the NL East? I, I would say National League East. I think the Central still has its holes at the bottom. Um, we don't really know what Pittsburgh planning on doing. They, they seem to be out of it completely. Um, obviously, it's the Cubs and the Cardinals kind of right now and, 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 and everyone else. Um, the National League East, you could have all four. I mean, obviously the Marlins are the Marlins, but the other four teams uh, all can all could be contenders. Uh, I, I would certainly expect the Nationals and the Braves uh, and the Phillies to continue doing what they did last year. Um, and now the Mets seem to be entering that fray. And I think when you have four out of five teams in a division that are going to be competitive, and not just competitive, but ultra competitive yeah. in terms of what they want to spend – and their approach to how they want to handle the season, it's going to make the National League East very interesting. Last thing here for you here, uh, Jared. Um, I mean, obviously Machado and, and Harper are the big fish out there on the pond, but who's the other name that we really should be kind of watching out for and, and that could realistically you know, sway some divisional races next year? Jose Abreu is something I've heard over the last few weeks. Uh, where he ends up, obviously, will not be with the White Sox next season. Um, and I think... Uh, on the pitching front, uh, Nathan Avaldi's name starting to get heated up over the last few weeks, uh, especially a few days, really. Um, I think Avaldi will kind of set the tone for where the Yankees go from here. And this is pretty ironic that we've done an entire baseball hot stove and we've really <laughs> not talked about the Yankees yeah. at all. And, and I think that really is telling to where baseball is kind of at right now in terms of its free agent market. Um, I, I think Abreu, I've heard a few different teams on him, but Evaldi, I, I do think Evaldi's a, an interesting linchpin. 
because the Yankees obviously missed out on Corbin and where they want to go with Jay Happ is going to set the tone with Evaldi. But I'm hearing the Red Sox still want to bring back Evaldi. Um, so you could see a bidding war perhaps in the coming days, and especially next week at the winter meetings, you're going to certainly see uh, these talks heat up uh, with Nathan Evaldi. And I do think he will be the next big name to go for sure. Jared Smith, MLB uh, reporter here, joining us on Press Row. As always, we appreciate the time, pal. Thanks so much. Absolutely, Christian. Anytime. All right, Jared Smith, uh, MLB reporter here. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, potential places, landing spots for guys. I, I don't know why, but you know the Machado thing, I'll tell you where I think he's going You know, coming up in a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll take a break. We'll come back, wrap up shop. Your listener questions on the other side. This is, You're on Press Row, broadcasting part of the Public House Media Network. Want to be part of the show? Go to Facebook and search Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. Or find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can also email the program Press Row PHM at gmail.com. This is Bryce Burge, host of Your Soccer Passport here on Public House Media. After this episode, come join us on a trip around the soccer world as we discuss club and country every Tuesday. Stamp your soccer passport by subscribing on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your Public House Media podcasts. And thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a Public House Media podcast. Close up shop here on Press Row, broadcasting part of the Public House Media Network. As always, with your listener questions, find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can email the show Press Row PHM at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Facebook, Press Row Podcast by Public House Media. Easy way to get in touch with the show. Find me on Twitter as well, at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Matt in Texas, Ezekiel Elliott fined for uh, his Salvation Army donation. Is this just more proof that the NFL really stands for no fun league? 100%. Like This is one of the dumbest things. This is why the NFL is in the situation that it's in. It doesn't allow its players to have a personality. It doesn't allow guys to do... Now, don't get me wrong. They did a great thing this past weekend with the cleats. Uh, You saw a bunch of guys wearing specialty cleats and all that stuff. But the fact that Ezekiel Elliott is going to get fined almost $14,000 for an unsportsmanlike conduct for, you know, dropping $21 in the Salvation Army, you know how much money that he probably helped raise for the Salvation Army? He did the same thing. You know, a, a couple of years ago, when he jumped, or when he jumped into the bucket, and they didn't find him, they were they were actually, uh, you know, they they said he wasn't going to be fined for jumping into the kettle, but for you know, twenty one, you know, uh, dollars to be put in there, it, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's so dumb. Uh, good on the Cowboys though. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott and Dak Prescott both pledged twenty one thousand dollars in donations. The Cowboys matched that. So, it, it, I mean. I can't believe it. it's one of the dumbest things. The NFL can't get out of its own way. The fact that they're going to fine a guy for donating money to to a charity on national TV don't have don't have it there. Don't allow that as an option. Then, if you're going to fine a guy for it, but it makes no sense for the NFL. It's just more proof that this is a league that doesn't care about its players, doesn't really care about the fan base. Uh, they don't understand what their image is. So the NFL is is, is a bigger joke than uh, than you know it. it it already was. It continues to be a massive joke. Uh, Brandon asking, uh, now with the Orioles having their general manager in place, who can they reach out to? Who can they try to get to, to be competitive next year? I hate to tell tell you, Brandon, but uh, the Orioles are not going to be competitive in, in 2019. There's absolutely no chance whatsoever. They've yet to hire their manager. Um, Chip Hale seems to be one of the, the top guys. I, I like Chip Hale. I think he'd be pretty good. Um uh, Mike Bell is an interesting person. Brandon Hyde potentially uh, with with the Cubs, but the Orioles are not going to be competitive this year. The Rays uh, are talented. You look at that division last year. You had the Red Sox with 108 wins, Yankees with 100, Tampa Bay with 90. The Blue Jays were 16 games under 500, but still uh, they had moments where they were competitive. But you know that Rays team, surprisingly, despite all the changes that they made, are going to be talented again this year. So. I hate to say it, but the Orioles have absolutely zero chance of being competitive here in 2019. 
and then let's see here, Sam in Pennsylvania. Uh, with the Phillies acquiring Gene Segura. Does this mean they are out on Manny Machado? I, I think it does. I mean, obviously, this is it, it pretty much means that there is no Manny Machado. There's still a chance for Bryce Harper, but, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that is uh, quite interesting with regards to uh, where he could end up. I still believe that he would do great in the Cubs organization. I think he'd be phenomenal there with the Cubs. I know a lot of people didn't like that idea when I first brought it up, but you put him in that infield with, you know, Rizzo, with Chris Bryant, with Javi Baez, you got a great, you got a dynamite infield there. So I would love, absolutely love to see Manny Machado go and play uh, for the Cubs. It, it would be a lot of fun. Brewers fans are getting a chance to hate on him a lot uh, over the years after what happened uh, during the playoffs, but could be could be some fun there for, for, uh, for Cubs fans to have uh, Manny there. I, I think he would be a great addition to that lineup too. So uh, I'm I'm all for the, I don't see it happening, but I'm all for the Cubs acquiring Manny Machado. Bryce Harper, I thought it was interesting to hear Jared talk about that and say, you know, maybe the Mets are, are, are a possibility for him and not just to drive up the price, but maybe to actually go out there and, and, and maybe try to make something happen. So uh, who knows? We'll see exactly how it all happens. Big thanks to Jared Smith for joining us on the show. Uh, big thanks to you guys, as always, for your listener questions. Can't do the show without you guys. We really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review. Share us with your friends and family. Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Check out the new website, publichousemedia.org, publichousemedia.org. And as always, you can get in touch with the show on social media. Twitter and Instagram handles at PressRowPHM. You can email the show, PressRowPHM at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Press Row Podcast by Public House Media. Find me on Twitter as well at Chris Heimel, C H R I S H E I M A L L. Enjoy your Thursday night. Enjoy your weekend here. Uh, and you follow me on Twitter and understand one thing that this weekend it's, uh, it's four words, two statements, but one mission. Go Army, beat Navy. Thanks for joining us here on Press Row. <laughs>